Welcome to a special edition of the BioCentury This Week podcast. I'm Jeff Cranmer, executive editor here at BioCentury, and today we are previewing the third BioCentury Bay Helix East West Biopharma Summit. It's scheduled for March 4th through 6th in Singapore. Joining me to help set the stage for the event are Wendy Pan, the chair of Bay Helix, who is a partner at Goodwin where she leads the Asia Life Sciences practice, and Frank Ledoux, a senior partner at McKinsey, where he co-leads the firm's Asia healthcare practice, and Carl Firth, CEO of US-listed biotech Aslan. Carl is on the boards of several biotechs. BioCentury, Bay Helix, and McKinsey have had a 10-year collaboration based on our mutual interest in fostering cross-border innovation. Bay Helix is, of course, the nonprofit organization that connects cross-border life sciences, business leaders in China, elsewhere in Asia, and the U.S. And from the BioCentury side, we're joined by BioCentury's co-founder, president, and CEO, David Flores, Josh Berlin, BioCentury's head of BD, and... Editor-in-Chief Simone Fishburne, who regular listeners of our podcast, of course, know as a fixture and a bit of a tennis aficionado, though I don't think we'll dabble in that space tonight. Now, this is the third time, as I said, that we're hosting this event, and the first we are hosting it in Singapore. It comes as we are seeing record cross-border deal flow as Western biopharmas look to Asia for innovative assets. I'd like to bring in David now to kick us off. David, BioCentury has hosted the summit in the Bay Area, in Boston. Why is now the right time to have this meeting in Singapore? Well, actually it goes back for more than a year. We've been intently looking at taking East West to Singapore for well more than a year when we began to see that it was becoming a destination for sophisticated life science investors from both Asia and the West. And as you just said, Biocentury, Bay Helix, and McKinsey have spent the last 10 years knitting together cross-border networks, aiming to join East and West. So seeing new money mix with Singapore's science base, as well as its access to Asian markets with vast potential, it became obvious that Singapore should be a link on this chain. Is it early days? Yes, but if you take too long to think about it, the moment will pass. We think it's now the time to create more visibility and dialogue about the innovation story in the entire Asia Pacific region. We call it the arc of innovation. It extends from India through Singapore, Southeast Asia, up through East Asia and Korea to Japan and down through Australia. So this year in Singapore, East West 2024, will gather the international stakeholders to identify the next steps required to build this arc of innovation. Thanks for that, David. I'd like to bring in Wendy now. Wendy, uh, you just took over as chair of Bay Helix. Of course, you've been a longtime partner at Goodwin. There are a lot of biotech deals crossing your desk. Uh, I'd love to just hear quickly from you. What have you been seeing in Asia biopharma deal making of late? I have to say, and uh, starting uh, about 18 months ago, and they being a wave of out licensing deals from China, Chinese biotech and pharma companies out license assets into mostly big farmers and some small companies, which actually is um, quite new because a couple of years ago, um, you will see most of the cross-border deals between China and uh, US and Europe, it's in licensing into China. So this is a very, very uh, interesting trend. Um, Frank, I remember in December in the BioCentury conference in Shanghai, McKinsey presented the survey saying the deal, Chinese out licensing deals accounted for about 3% three or four years ago. And uh, as of November or October last year, it quadrupled to 12%. I think, you know, like uh, in November, in December, in January, the number probably 
you know, like um, increased again significantly, both in terms of number of the deals and the volume of deals. So one is the size volume. And the second trend I want to say, you know, it covers a number of modalities. It's not just, you know, buying ADC programs from China. Uh, it covers cell therapies and SRI NACE Protex. And one thing I want to mention about cell therapies is in China, because of this special IIT pathway, a lot of CGT companies and actually are looking into China because, you know, it's faster. You can see the uh, obtain the data, efficacy data faster. The third point I want to make is uh, in terms of players. In the past, it was big farmers. After the GSK's acquisition of Iolas, uh, you know, which was supported by a number of VC PE funds, I actually encountered a number of VC PE funds from the U.S. who are trying to do the same type of deal. Wendy, let me ask you something. Sure. You've talked a lot about the deals coming from China, and we've, you know, obviously discussed the real increasing innovation and people accessing that from China. But do you think that is going beyond China also to other countries in Asia? Obviously, China's the dominant one in Asia right now. We're seeing a lot of innovation in some of the other countries. And do you expect to see cross-border deals accessing innovation like that as well? Definitely, I would say, and, you know, biotech companies from Korea, a number of um, Korean biotech companies have been doing outlicensing transactions and um, ADC companies such as Lego Cam. Yeah, and just to, to rebound on that, actually, our, our data suggests that about 25% of all licensing deals are originated from Asia. 25%. <laughs> so, it's, yeah. it's 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 a China story, but it goes beyond China, certainly, right? And I think what will be interesting to discuss at the conference is how much momentum is there outside of China and what could be really the role of Asia overall five years, 10 years from now. Could well, Asia be the new majority of licensing deals? Like it is the new majority of a, on a number of economic metrics at this point, whether it's GDP, GDP growth, technology investment. New energy, and I think, renewable, I think we except. should emphasize, Frank, right, that when you're talking about these licensing deals, they're not only licensing it assets for use in Asia. They're actually licensing global rights, if I've got it right, for for these innovative assets coming from the Asia countries. Yeah, I think the data covers both regional and global deals. But mm -hmm. yes, I mean, the, the big trend, which is actually something we should discuss as well, right, at, at this point, it does feel to me a little bit like the goal of Asian based about a company is actually to license out to the West and particularly to the US, which you know is certainly a great source of value creation because that's where revenues and profits are today. But I'm hoping that Asian companies over time will have a different ambition, which is maybe to also create value within Asia, where we have enormous patient unmet needs and where, quite frankly, a lot of economic development and population development is going to happen in the next 20 years. So I think to me, that's actually the more interesting topic mid to long term beyond just the short term wave of ad licensing to the US. Frank, thanks for those thoughts. Carl, I know you want to jump in here. Yeah, so look, this maybe if I can wave the Singapore flag for a moment. I think it's been really interesting to see a number of deals also coming out of Singapore. I mean, we, we mm -hmm. as our company, we've licensed assets to BMS. We've seen deals being done with Boeing Ingelheim. Again, looking to Singapore for innovation, but using that innovation for them for global rights. But I think going forwards to Frank's point, you're also seeing a lot of Singapore companies saying, well, how can they take advantage of that positioning based here in the middle of the region to also start exploring some of the regional markets? Yeah, Carl, that's, that's exactly what I wanted to ask you about. Uh, your company has its roots in Singapore. I know, you've, you know you have a footprint elsewhere in Asia. You're listed in the U.S. Your shop is just down the street here from me in the Bay Area as well. But let's talk Singapore. You... You know the country's biotech scene very well, and I'm curious specifically what's needed to help the ecosystem evolve, get to the next level. Yeah, so look, Singapore's been investing in the biotech ecosystem uh, even before I came to Asia in 2004. But I think 
uh, progress, particularly in recent years, has been remarkable. And I think some really strong foundations are being built, uh, such as the establishment of some world leading centers of research. But the house isn't quite complete. So I think some of the key challenges that remain, you know, besides the obvious small market limited trial population around talent and the lack of bellwethers. So in terms of talent, Singapore really lacks experienced entrepreneurs and seasoned biotech execs. Uh, some great research and clinical scientists. There's a good talent based in clinical operations, thanks to the, the many CRO stationed here. But we don't have many entrepreneurs that have done it before. Most of the CEOs here are first time CEOs. And it's been challenging attracting foreign talent to, to build management teams. Um, I do think this will improve over time. And if you look at sort of how this has evolved, you know, the first generation of companies here in, um, you know, in Singapore, by the way, if you're a trekker like me, you can think of these as sort of like classic Star Trek. These were companies like S-Bio, A-Bio, Mirli in, in the early 2000s. None of them are around now. Uh, they were generally headed by foreigners who then subsequently left Singapore. Then came the second generation or the next generation that included us, Aslan, companies like Hummingbird, .bio, Tessa, uh, founded 2010 and onwards. And now we're into the third generation, Think Star Trek Discovery, you know, companies like Automira, Paratus, Engine Bio, and these companies have got a slate of international investors, often advancing, you know, homegrown discoveries. And with each new generation comes more experience and growth of this talent base that we need to create the next biotech. I think the second challenge is we don't have a local biotech or farmer of scale today, no bellwethers. Now, do we really need one? Uh, I think it would help. Uh, I think bellwethers have got a critical role in an ecosystem, uh, helping you know, fostering innovation, especially the translation of academic innovation. Uh, I think companies like GSK, AstraZeneca have been critical in the UK success. Uh, Roche Novartis have you know, put Switzerland on the map. To me, those are the key challenges that, that Singapore really is going to have to address in order to build a self-sustaining ecosystem. Thanks for that, Carl. And, and, and it was quite a roster of companies you listed there, several of them will be presenting companies at the East-West Summit. Delighted to have a few of them on board. Paratus, particularly interesting. Uh, our colleague Steve Usden did a nice profile on this company who uh, bats are a big part of what they're up to. Uh, Frank, let me jump back over to you. Yeah, I think very interesting to, to listen to Carl, who obviously knows Singapore very well, because part of what we've been trying to do in our report is actually to deep dive into each of the, I would say, most relevant innovation country in Asia, Korea, Japan, Singapore, China, obviously, but also even India, and really figure out, you know, where are they on their buildup of an innovation ecosystem, right? You know, across a range of dimension from like what we call foundational capabilities, which include like basic research, discovery, development, manufacturing, and commercialization, as well as key enablers of an innovation ecosystem that are well known, right? Like government support, funding, talent and culture that Carl talked about, right? So we are trying to map out actually ecosystem by ecosystem, where are the strengths and where are the gaps? And our conclusion is that beyond China, who probably has the capacity to build a fully integrated ecosystem, still has some work to do, but has the scale and has most of the elements in place already, the other countries, even Japan, do still have major gaps in their ecosystem, right? So. Japan, for example, doesn't have a proper VC and PE community to support innovation to come from academia. They have strong academia. They mint new Nobel Prizes regularly, but they don't have that link between academia and um, you know, creation of, of startups that can be supported by a proper uh, funding mechanism. Right? And, and, and so that's a, a gap in, in Japan. Korea has similar gaps in different areas. India obviously has a long way to go on even things like uh, regulatory integration with the rest of the world. So the question then becomes, can each of those countries fix its own ecosystem and evolve into a self-sustaining ecosystem? Or is more collaboration across countries needed to actually make this overall Asia story stand on itself and become a big part of a global story? I think the questions kind of leads to the answer, obviously. And Frank, you, you mentioned the, the special report that you and your team are preparing for the conference. It's it's always one of the highlights of BioCentury conferences, the McKinsey report. Sometimes it's two reports. This one, as you mentioned, on Asia's arc of innovation. And that report will be specially delivered to participants at the East-West Summit. Let me turn back to Carl real quick to follow up on what you were saying, Frank. Yeah, I, I think what's, what's really interesting is 
you know, all these companies, as Frank says, have got the, the challenges that they need to sort of complete the missing pieces of the puzzle. And the question is, what, what's going to provide that step change, that shift in gear? And I think in Singapore, particularly, you've got a very interesting opportunity. And if you'd asked me five years ago, I would have said access to capital is one of the key challenges here. Now, I don't think this has been addressed, but we've come a long way over recent years, and there's been a huge influx of capital into Singapore. I'll just give you some numbers. You know, wealth managed by asset managers here have doubled over the last six years to $4 trillion. There are 1,100 family offices. This is just 400 in 2020. And then Biotech, an incredible number of funds are set up or moved teams to Singapore. You've got Polaris, Novo, Flagship, Chiming, Life, Panacea, uh, CBC, and, and many more. Now, they didn't come here just to invest in the local ecosystem. They came here for the same reason that the number of applicants at my kids' school went up 300% year on year. Um, a massive influx of capital, companies, people from other parts of Asia, such as China and Hong Kong, driven by geopolitical tensions between China and the US. Couple that with a robust financial ecosystem that we've got here in Singapore, strong financial institutions, rule of law, and the floodgates open. Now, David, I know you often talk about how healthcare innovation is global. It should be about the, you know, about the patients, and it shouldn't matter where the innovation comes from, where it's developed or where it's manufactured, as long as it benefits the patients. But unfortunately, today that's not the reality. And you only have to look at, you know, how select committee hearings on Chinese CDMOs to see that. Uh, and Singapore, um, rightly or wrongly, has been the beneficiary of, of this system. And we're seeing this commitment and funding at all levels. We've seen Clavis Bio come out of Tomasek with some really robust ability to finance and, and support and build up the ecosystem, plus new incentives being developed by the uh, Singapore government uh, alongside some of the tax uh, treaty changes that we've seen, which could allow companies to actually reclaim money that's spent here over a four-year period, a little bit like the uh, Australia's R&D credit scheme. So I think you know, a real opportunity to shift gear and, and plug that important piece that was missing here in Singapore. You mentioned Clavis Bio. That's, of course, headed up by Ku Shi, who you know, was at Tomasic for a long time. They've built a portfolio of 12 or more companies now. And Ku Shi uh, was kind enough to join uh, Simone on the BioCentury show a couple of weeks ago. So you can go to BioCentury's YouTube channel if you want to dig a little deeper into what's happening in the Singapore biotech ecosystem. I want to stay with Singapore just for another moment and turn back to Wendy and just ask Wendy what she's seeing in terms of transactions within the country. I would say there is a growing activities of transactions within countries such as China. A number of Bayhelix members, you know, like they actually did transactions with each other. I think, you know, the fact that they know each other um, really helped the transaction dynamics. Apart from transactions within the country, they have been growing transactions within the region as well. Sometimes, you know, Chinese licensors, um, they would keep the Southeast Asia rights and do transactions. I have done transactions, you know, representing Chinese companies with Southeast Asia countries or India. So I do think, you know, these transactions tend to be smaller, but there's a growing number of transactions within the region. Excellent. Thanks for that, Wendy. Uh, well, I'd like to talk a little bit about the program we have in store. If if you're on the fence about whether or not you should fly to Singapore, if, it, if it's not enough that Taylor Swift will also be in town that week, then let us tease you with a few of the big biotech names who will be there. I know David will be talking to Art Pappas, and Simone, you'll be talking to, to Doug Williams. Simone, Dave, tell us a little about why we chose those two to uh, be in our fireside chats. Well, somebody raised Art Pappas in one of our discussions, and I've known Art for a long, long, long time, and probably I am the person in our entire staff, since everybody's younger than I am, who remembers that Art has been an old Asia hand and has seen what Asia was and what it is today, and we thought it was very important, in addition to the fact that he now has a Singapore-oriented fund, to bring him in and be able to do the compare and contrast between Asia today and Asia yesterday. And I'm really looking forward to speaking to Doug Williams. We've known him at Biocentury for a long time. He's actually also a member of our scientific advisory board. 
he has been involved in developing blockbusters from Enbrel and Tech Federa from his days at uh, Biogen. And then he, you know, was in Seattle Genetics and more recently in Kodiak. And throughout all of these, he's actually been involved in something that I think is really important today with all these new modalities, which is really advanced manufacturing is, is one of the themes that I'm going to get into with him, which is, you know, how do you take a new modality and develop a manufacturing system and a regulatory path for that? And I think that any ecosystem that wants to be at the forefront, like Singapore does, will really need to grapple and be able to take their innovations, their discoveries, and bring them into a drug development paradigm. They're going to need some of that kind of experience. And Doug is just a, a really thoughtful and scientific person to talk to about these things. So I'm I'm super excited about that. I'm looking at the schedule now. I think it's called a happy hour chat, which I think also might mean a little glass of wine with it. So how bad can that be? Never, never a problem uh, with that, Simone. Well, crazily, the uh, quietest person on this podcast is is the one who's actually the architect behind it all, uh, my colleague, Josh Berlin. Uh, Josh, would love to hear what you're most excited about on the program, or at least some other highlights. Yeah, thanks, guys. And uh, I've been uh, taking notes here, listening to everyone. I'm getting really excited about all us coming to uh, Singapore uh, a week from now. We, we have a really global program this year. We have local leaders, several that have been mentioned uh, today on the show, Kushi of Clavis Bio, Piers Ingram of Hummingbird, Jeff Liu of Engine Bio, Daphne Teo of NSG Biolabs, and just sort of a who's who, in addition to Carl from the uh, Singapore ecosystem. We also have an unbelievable collection of Western VCs that are attending. Uh, Joya Ventures, Flagship, MPM, Novo Holdings, Polaris. We also have several of the top China VCs like CBC Group and Life Capital and Qi Ming attending. And then quite a few pharma BDL and BDNL leaders, AbbVie, J&J, Mark Kaga, MSD, Novo Nordisk. So just a, a really great collection of leaders from across the ecosystem. We also have over 40 biotechs that'll be presenting on the roadshow track that includes Singapore biotechs. We have quite a few Korea biotechs on the roadshow track, China biotechs, as well as some Western biotechs. So I think for me, the what I'm looking forward to most is, is just everybody getting in the room together, networking, partnering. You know, we are starting to run out of partnering slots. So if you are registered, please make sure to go ahead and, and set up your meetings as soon as possible. And um, really just looking forward to getting everyone in the room and debating sort of how to build biotech ecosystems that are globally competitive. Looking forward to Frank and, and McKinsey's report and um, hope to see everybody in, uh, in Singapore March 4th to 6th. You know, one more thing to mention, Josh, for the first time at the East-West Summit, we'll be having poster sessions featuring local academics showing off what they're working on. And uh, our colleague, Karen takach Tuzman, who heads up our translational coverage, is overseeing that, making connections across borders to get some really interesting researchers in the house. And as Josh said, there's still time to register for the conference. It kicks off March 4th. And if you can't make it to Singapore, you can register to attend digitally. Head to biocentryeastwest.com. You can register there, learn more about the summit program, check out the presenting companies. Uh, and to get ready for the meeting, check out, as I mentioned earlier, BioCentury's interview with Ku Shi, CEO of Clavis Bio on the BioCentury show. Uh, Simone speaks with her about how the Singapore VC firm is building a global strategy to propel the local ecosystem. Uh, you'll find it on BioCentury's YouTube channel, and you'll also find Simone's conversation with Amy Schulman of Polaris, who will also be at the event. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope to see you in Singapore or hope to have you register digitally. Uh, I'd like to thank my guests, Wendy Pan of Goodwin and chair of Bay Helix, Frank of McKinsey, Carl of Aslan Bio, David Flores, our CEO here at BioCentury, Josh Berlin, our head of BD, who, if you have any questions about the conference, feel free to reach out to Josh. 
and of course, Simone, who uh, you just heard from on our latest podcast, and you'll be hearing from again. And if you're in Singapore, uh, don't forget to uh, grab her a glass of wine and, and talk a little tennis. Thanks, folks. And of course, Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for BioCentury this week. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education.